What's up, Magic fans, and welcome to Penny for Your Thoughts. Uh, my name's Mikey. Um, as usual, I'm joined by the Welsh Josh Cohen. Mr. Geraint Jones, evening, buddy. Good evening. How are you, mate? All good. That's a little bit serious. I know. I know. It's a serious <laughs> podcast, isn't it? <laughs> Is it? No. Yeah. Good. Let's when get down to business. Happen? <laughs> when did that happen, mate? No, I'm only messing. All right. Money All right. Messing. I got you. And uh, then we're joined by the, I was, I was a list there, the uh, elder statesman of the team. <laughs> Hey, hey, from Moana, as your daughter calls you, <laughs> or as we've, decided, uh, as we've decided to start calling you, Calamity, because you've had yes, more injuries it's, it's this earned. week. It's earned, yes, yes. Which, uh, well, you've mentioned two. I mean, I can only remember one. Well, oh, hang on, unless you're talking about where I did, where I did my ankle earlier. There you the go. Week. Yeah, yeah, I forgot that one, calling the dog, um, not looking where I was going and smashing my foot into a... Uh, into a root of a tree was uh, rather uncomfortable. That's uh, that managed changing my calf muscle. And then today, gardening, <laughs> I've uh, managed to get uh, wire cutters and cut through the nail and finger of the, uh, the small finger through through the nail and cut the uh, deep bit into the skin below. So yeah, yeah, another good Sunday, mate. <laughs> and for those who are watching on YouTube, can we see it? Let's, let's have a look at the bandage it's, that you put. Look at bandage. that. It's, that is horrendous. You can see, you can see it's, it's that all this this wedge at the top is padding. And you can see that it's bled through it. Wow. <laughs> it's got so much um, lint and dressings on there. And it's and it's managed to bleed through it. Probably should have gone to hospital. But a bit of super I'd glue, got, that'll do the trick, right, doesn't it? I'd got, I'd got gardening to do and the dog to walk, so... <laughs> You well and truly are Mr. Bump, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, mate, I just can't argue. I am an absolute danger to myself. <laughs> and it's always on a Sunday. I, I've got no idea why. Yeah. Well, the angle always wasn't on a Sunday. A Sunday. So, it, well, hey, you sure it weren't last Sunday? No, I'm going to have to check this. I'm You're going to check now, aren't you? When, yeah, when, when message you yeah absolutely. It definitely wasn't a Sunday. No chance. Um, well, I obviously deferred it, it for a day. It was a long message that went. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, are. <laughs> uh, I think it was Tuesday. Looking at this, but there we go. Oh, Any day dear. is a calamity day for Mr. Bacon. It is, mate. It is. Good lad. And I we... I'd done that <laughs> until the next one. And uh, yeah. and this week we are joined by a friend of the show, um, Ian Holmes, who's a big Magic fan from the UK. We know Ian really well. Um, how are you, mate? Thanks for coming on. I'm really good. I'm I'm a lot better after we're hearing uh, after hearing Paul's <laughs> the week that he's had. I mean, I can't really let that slip. I mean, first, I mean, obviously the uh, the the thing with the fingers, the obvious one. But did I hear it right? So you kicked the root of a tree and managed to pull your calf muscle. Yeah. How hard yeah. did you kick it, <laughs> mate? Mike, you'll tell you when when when. I walk, when I go out for a walk, I walk at a good pace. I'm sort of 16 minutes my, a mile. Um, so, yeah, it was a good pace. And I just was completely tree unaware. Just came out of nowhere. The tree got like, in the way. Who, who, who would have thought that when you're walking in a woods, there are trees? And who would have thought they had roots? Apparently not me. I just love the fact that it's like, <laughs> didn't break my toe. No, I, like third metatarsal on the right. I really gave the root a good kick. So I pulled my calf. It was really <laughs> good. I, 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 even, I even managed to not stub the, the, the toes or anything on it. It was the base of the foot. I actually managed to jar the heel into it. So, And, and obviously, so today's, today's medical drama, um, can we officially class that as a bacon slice? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is so I'm having that. I'm not <laughs> Do you know what, mate? And we've started in, in 53 years, that is the most original bacon <laughs> gag I've heard about this surname. Well done, mate. Top uh, job. Uh, <laughs> a joke was sizzling. Oh, oh please! You know how you know how much <laughs> I love David Steele and Jeff Turner, but that is starting to really grate on me. All the bacon puns, I could really? do without it. 
Yeah, I know I've not mentioned it in the in the group chat hey, that we have. Starting to sound a bit smoky <laughs> about it all now. Is it getting you a bit frazzled? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just do this. Let's just keep doing this. This is, <laughs> this is a great no, start. No, it's not fair. I feel like I'm hogging the conversation here. <laughs> quality oh i've got to chill out now that's correct me up um, <laughs> this is like last week hank i don't know how to carry on from here oh mate You've peaked at four minutes peaked <laughs> peaked all right uh, let's go what bo- what bothers me is there's so there are so many bits that you're going to be using as the clips for the intros to the week that you that you put out mike i'm i'm just going to get Abuse all week here. You're gonna get well, well right. Done. You get abuse anyway. <laughs> Never stops. <laughs> right, that's me gone. Good night. Right, <laughs> moving on then. Moving on. Um, so Ian, those who don't know who you are, how did you become a magic fan? Um, and uh how long you've been been a fan of the magic and <laughs> look at Paul. Sorry. <laughs> hey. Do you want us to pause the podcast there? Do you want a moment? Oh, this is a serious bacon, podcast. Bacon slice, bacon slice has absolutely <laughs> done me. But Ian's had his chance to come on and you just... <sighs> this is it. This is my moment. We've already right. started this is a serious <laughs> podcast and you're just ruining it with puns. And <laughs> What about you, Paul, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate. That, honestly, that line's done me. That is quality. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Oh, Paul, been well done. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm back in the room. I'm all good. <laughs> all right. I'll let you guys get a breathe then while I tell you my magic story. Go so, very, very similar to um, to Alan and Gary a couple of weeks a couple of weeks ago. To be honest with you, like my my era was really early '90s. Really, was when I came into it, and it's a ridiculous, ridiculous story. To be honest with you, like. I used to knock about with a couple of mates across the road and it was like Wonder Years, Boy Meets World type stuff. They had the hoop on the on the garage sort of thing. And every day we just used to spend all our time playing basketball. And I must have only been about eight or nine, something like that. Um, but they were two or three years older. They were both big into the NBA. Uh, one of them sported Chicago, uh, MJ and Scotty Pippen. And <clears throat> uh, the other guy sported Phoenix and a big Charles Barkley fan. And I was just I was just there playing and I was into it, but I didn't have a team. And then they were like, Oh, you've got it, you've got to have a team, you've got to have someone to follow, who are you gonna follow? And then we were we were, we were playing like in on the Super NES in their house or something at the time. And one of the lads, the Chicago fan, had a Scotty Pippin poster on the wall and he was dunking, <laughs> he was dunking on, I think it I don't know who it was, but it was um it was an Orlando team and they had the black pinstripe jerseys on. I was like, who are they? I like, I like. I like those. I like those kicks. They're nice. Um, <laughs> like, oh, they're Orlando Magic. They're rubbish. I was like, oh well, I'll do that then. And then the year after, they drafted Shaq. So <laughs> jokes on them. Um, <laughs> and, the, and the rest, as they say, is history. And it was like, um, it was, it was. I mean, you know what it's like. It was a different breed to what it is now. Trying to trying to follow the NBA in the early nineties. And I remember, I used to get, uh, I used to watch CNN. Um, a teletext on CNN every morning, page 570, before I went to school to get the match report from the night before. So you had like an A4 page teletext piece with the with the match report. And then I s- stumbled across the Pontel videos. Um, and then once I got the Pontel videos, that was it. That was game changer. Um, and I was, like I said, I, I was lucky. I got into it in like 90, 90, 92, 93, 94. And it was Shaq and Penny and they were like, I think very similar to like what Alan and Gary said. It was like um, it was a they were just like the Beatles at the time. It was the it was the exciting thing to be to be Orlando at the time, and um, it was very easy to follow from this side of the pond. So it was great. Good man, good man. Well, we got a little more questions to throw at you later in the pod. Um, so we'll do the uh, weekly roundup where we had four games this week. Um, some notable transactions uh, that went down. We waived Ken Birch, um, who we saw play for Toronto the other evening. Um, and we also waived Kareem Mane, signing Devin Kennedy to a two-way contract. And we signed Dante Hall and Robert Franks to 10-day contracts. So a few new additions for the for the Magic this week. Um, 
So starting with the Bucks, uh, we lost 124 to 87 last Sunday. The only bright spot in that game was was Mo Bamba, who finished with 21 points. So was that a career high? I can't remember now. Mm. Career high. Yeah, I think he was. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. Five rebounds. Um, he went eight for 11 from the field, including five from six from three. Um, so we'll, we'll skip that one. Uh, then we re, uh, then we had the Spurs the following night. So back to back, uh, we lost 120 to 97. Um, a similar game where the Magic really struggled scoring um, in the opening quarter. San Antonio built a 23 point lead at half time and never really looked back from there. Um, one notable performance was RJ Hampton, who finished with 16 points and eight rebounds and also went seven from 10 from the field. <laughs> Um, and then we had a a reunion with uh, Nikola Vucevic on Wednesday when we uh, faced the Chicago Bulls. Um, the first time we've played Vooch since he since he was traded there. Um, and to be honest, if it wasn't for Vooch, it probably would have got out of hand a lot lot quicker. Um, both him and and uh, and Zach Levine both had twenty nine and thirty respectively. Um, James Ennis had a team high for the Magic, 22 points, including five threes. Um, six players in double digits in that game. Um, and the Magic went on to win 115 to 106. Um, Ian, what was your thoughts on, on, that, on the Bulls, um, more specifically with Vooch now? Because um, you mentioned to me when I spoke to you the other day, it feels like the Bulls have suddenly become what the Magic were by trading for Vooch. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been... It's been pretty well covered, obviously, now since the trade deadline, hasn't it? But uh, it just seems to me, from a Chicago perspective, it was just a really strange move. Like, I think all all the chips fell in in line for us, and it, it, everything kind of all the dominoes fell at the right time. And, and obviously, we we've gone in the direction we have. And I think most people now that the dust has settled are pretty comfortable with that. It, it's quite a logical step, and and I think we're all quite happy with the path that we're on and the and the return that we've got for it but from a from a chicago perspective it's just strange because we obviously we know what vooch is and, and what he brings but um the best that he can make them is basically us um and that's not is that's not going to get them where they want to be so for them to kind of mortgage their future especially with the light protections and, and we're looking at a couple of their picks in the next two or three years um, and they're not going to go over the top. Do you know what I mean? They're, yeah. they're scrapping the scrapping to get the play in this year. Um, and that, I mean, I think their, their ideal world was that obviously they get Vooch, they pair him with Zach Levine and they go on a tear and they get comfortably get in the playoffs, maybe even get up to the sixth seed. Um, but that's not happened. And even, even in a Cinderella type story and, and they do really, they did really succeed on the back of Vooch going there. Their ceiling's still no higher than what ours was with, with J.I. and A.G. and Evan and, and Markel. So I, I don't really see what they've done, especially with their limited flexibility going forward. I think they can do a few things to try and sort of like keep Zach Levine, but they're going to struggle to add to it, which is what they need to do to become a, a top four team in the East. Um, I mean... It wouldn't surprise me if if Vooch is on the market again within the next within the next year. To be honest with you, because as that as that contract, don't, we know that we've we've done team friendly contracts with with a few of our guys over the last few years. Vooch is one of them. Um, so I think he, he's got two years left, hasn't he? Is it two yeah. after this year? Yeah, yeah, he's got two years left after this year. So maybe not next year, but it wouldn't surprise me if come trade deadline next year or next summer that that things start talking for them, but. They're, they're going to need to kind of recuperate some assets because I, I feel like we um, we got away with one really there. I mean, we all we all love Booch, but we had our limitations and now our path is defined. And I know we'd spoken about it in, in the past a few months ago, Mikey, and I'd kind of brought up with the season that Vooch was having, was it was it time to kind of trade high almost this is his, yeah. his value was never going to be as high as it is right now like he's having a career season and uh, all-star season should i say um and and i feel like particularly with i mean we, we could end up in a top top eight seven pick from chicago this year and and they could miss out on the on the playing and yeah. be mortgage to boot that's a result for us and and is he'll, he'll go in he'll go into um 
Orlando Magic history as one of the greatest, which he, he rightly should for his longevity and, and what he's done in a tough period. But um, I think it was a great deal for us. And I'd be, and especially when you throw in um, how, how Wendell Carter's looked since as well, which, which is no, no afterthought, really. I mean, it was a bit of a throw in at the time, but that's looking better and better with every game that goes past. Do you, do you think do you think um the style of play a team's got to play with Vucevic on the floor now I know he's a great shooter but you know high pick and rolls and everything we're seeing a lot more points in the paint from our team now now that we've got Wendell Carter uh, we're not seeing as much high pick and roll uh, you know a lot of jump shots from the big men etc do you think that having you know a player like Vucevic um you're almost at a ceiling of you know winning three or four in ten? I don't necessarily know. I think it depends on the people that you've got around him, to be honest with you. I mean, Vooch, Vooch has got the skill set to be dominant in the paint as well. I mean, we saw it less and less over the last couple of years. He Obviously, once he's developed that, that three-point shot at the top of the arc, that's where so much of his points were coming from for us. I think where we're seeing the increase in points in the paint comes from not having that as a weapon as much. Um, so obviously, Wendell Carter, who's, who's, who's probably averaging, what, 16, 17 points while he's been with us, they're, for the most part, coming in and around the back, about around the basket. Um, so I think I think with the players around him that can drive, I mean, in theory, he should, he's able to space the floor so he, he can open up the driving lanes. Um, but we've just not really had that with, with Mark Hell being out. I, it'd be interesting to see if our points in the paint had kind of start to creep up with Cole Anthony coming back, um, mm. if that had coincided with, with if, if Booch had have stayed, for instance. But um, yeah, we just we just haven't got anyone or didn't have anyone this season that was able to aggressively attack the paint really. And with once mm. Markel went down, I mean Cole Anthony's trying, but he's not he's not the greatest finisher around the rim. But I think RJ Hampton has got the potential to be obviously a force attacking attacking the paint, attacking the rim. Um, so I don't necessarily think that you're, you're restricted to winning three or four in 10, but I think he's a floor raiser rather than a ceiling raiser, definitely. Um, and then to finish off the week, uh, the Magic played the Raptors, um, which the Magic ended up losing that one, 113 to 102. Um, it was a good first half for Orlando. Uh, we led by four at the break. Um, but really, that, that lead disappeared quickly in the third quarter. The Raptors outscored the Magic 38-19. to 19. Um, They built a 15-point lead, despite having 17 turnovers in the game um, and resting pretty much their best five players. Um, they still ended up beating us um, on that one. Um, just a quick note on that one. I don't know if you guys saw Shams chart. Charani, I can never say his name properly, from The yeah. Athletic tweeted that the NBA have That's finding... That's my thing. Stop, t- stop taking my thing. <laughs> uh, that they have fined the Raptors 25 grand uh, for league policies on player rest and injury reporting. Kyle Lowry, Gary Trent Jr., OG Ananubi, uh, Pascal Siakam and Aaron Baines all sat out that game. Um, and it's funny because it's almost a tanking move and they still won the game. So it kind of backfired on them, really. But there we go. Um, so, yeah, so they are, they've got, at the moment, the Raptors have got the eighth worst record and they're sitting just outside the play in, the play in places. So that, that one didn't really work for them. So They're sinking like a stone, though, aren't they, Toronto? Yeah. They are, they're really good to see. Yeah, it's good. Really, <laughs> yeah. um, I've, got no lo- I've got no love for Toronto at all. What about Mr Especially Lowry? The fat flopper, mate. No, fat flopper. I can't stand the man. <laughs> would you? Would you say? And I don't want to sort of like uh, hijack this, but would you say Kyle Lowry is Orlando's most hated opponent? Yeah, I think it's very much up there. Yeah, yeah. Kyle yeah, Kuzma. Kyle Kuzma. He's just, he's what just a mouthy. That? He's just a mouth, though, isn't he? Yeah, he plays the league, though, doesn't he? He's Whereas, Pau Gasol yeah. or Kyle Lowry. Pau Gasol. What, most hated? He's a, most hated. He's a Laker. The Raptors are there, you know. It's the Lakers for me. But, uh, yeah, one, no, I don't like Lowry. And the thing is, Gordon's not here anymore, so we might not even have a problem with him. But, no, I get it, you know. Uh, MCW no, might I, still have one with him. 
Yeah. Oh yeah, and the rest of them. <laughs> so, any general thoughts, guys, this week on on the, how the games played out? We went one in three. Um, any players that stood out for you, Paul? I, I was. I'm sort of whether to go with Wendell or Gary Harris. But I'm going to go with Gary Harris. Um, he's the two. I think he's he's played two games this week. Certainly played against yeah. um, the Bulls, where he he had a really effective game. Uh, 15 points, six assists. He worked really hard. And a lot of the stuff he was doing on the defensive end isn't showing up in the box score. He's getting a lot of deflections and he's he's causing people to have to pass the ball away rather than taking a shot or being able to drive. I thought he played really well in that game against the, uh, the, against the Bulls. Um, and against the Raptors, he took Fred Van Vliet completely out of the game. You know, a guy who had 52 points against us in January held him to six points. He had a fantastic game. Yeah. Really, really worked hard against Van Vliet. Um, he's, what, averaging about 10 points a game for us, which is a reasonable return. Uh, he's knocked down a nice couple of shots. He's not got the greatest um, efficiency as far as shooting goes. He's missing more than a lot more than he's hitting. But, you know, he's, he's coming back after being out for 30 games, so he's still got some rust, rust to get rid of and I think he's had a really strong week so yeah that's who I've gone with cool. Ian cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah it's interesting with Gary Harris isn't it I mean, you were saying the other day weren't you um, Mikey that um, I wouldn't be surprised to see, this, see us try and flip him in the summer maybe um, depending on how he does he's, he's, I think he's looking to try and recuperate a little bit of value with us isn't he obviously he's, he's been out this season and he's, he's his outside shots being off and stuff. So I think it's a bit of a, a new opportunity for, for him to sort of like rekindle his value a little bit and almost reinvent himself. Obviously he was, he was a bit of an institution, wasn't he? So oh, yeah. he, can, he can kind of reinvent what he wants to be before his next big payday or what have you. But um, in terms of who stood out for me, I am all in on Wendell Carter. I am all in like, um, I've been waiting three seasons to try and get all in on Mobamba, and it's taken me about two games uh, to get all in on Wendell Carter. Um, I just, I'm like, he's everything that I want a player to be. Like, mm. he's dogged, he's like, I'm more about sort of like heart and hustle than I am about ability. Yeah. And I know, and I mean, like I'm a Sheffield United fan, so that goes a long. <laughs> I was just, I was just about to say that is a Leeds United and Sheffield United attitude to players. We want yeah. somebody that's really tough. Yeah, works, works their backside off every game. He can keep doesn't mind, home, doesn't yeah. Like, yeah, he doesn't mind getting knocked about a bit, <laughs> but he's going to give you, he's going to give one or two knocks back. Yeah, and it's worked out really well for us this season. So. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, the same applies for for my uh, magic players as well. Like um, I like MCW. Same reason. Can't shoot for the life of him. But like he's just. It was like the same. Like you was like where, where's he wonder as well. I just love these players that give everything, and it's free. You don't have to do anything. Do you know what I mean? And and that's what's always been my problem with Mo Bamba is, is he's got he's got the tools in theory, um, but. The thing that he's supposed to be able to do without any kind of skill whatsoever just doesn't seem to come naturally. Um, and I know that Mo's had his kind of, um, he's certainly had his issues in his first three years. Uh, we shouldn't overlook those, but I, I just think there's no smoke without fire, to be honest with you. Yet. It, it was the question mark over him when he was drafted. All these analysts were like, has he got the motor though? Has he got the motor? And here we are three years later, we're still asking the same questions yeah. with the caveat that, that he's not had a full off season. He broke his shin bone in the first season and now he's got long COVID and stuff. All these things will, of course, be factors, but we still don't know if he can put it in. And Wendell Carter has shown in half a dozen games or whatever it is that if he's got nothing else, he's going to leave it. He's going to leave it on the floor. But he has got something else as well. And he just seems so much more poised um, and just further down his, his kind of development, I think, than Mo. Um, and it doesn't help Mo that obviously he was taken directly after him in that 
in that draft, so there'll always be comparisons. But um, I just think, I just think Wendell Carter could really be good, really be good. So I can't wait to see it go. This is why I nearly went for. I was, as I said earlier on, I was. Do I go for Wendell? Do I go for Gary Harris? But Wendell, you look at his week. Uh, well, not his week. He's had eleven games with us. He's shooting. He's hitting fourteen point five points a game. Yeah. Um, he's shooting fifty five percent field goal percentage. He's really effective in the paint. He's given Jokic a really hard game uh, to the point where Jokic was really frustrated by him. He did the same thing to Sabonis. I know Sabonis had a better scoring game, but he also he was very effective against Sabonis. Um, I also thought against Vooch, he was he had a really good game, and he went back to Chicago and he wanted to show them that they'd got rid of a good player. And I also thought when when we played Toronto in that first half, he really played Ken Birch well, a guy against a guy who knew what plays we were going to be running and all that sort of thing. He played him really well. I thought he was very, very effective. So yeah, that's that's where I was as well. Jonesy, intangib- so sorry, go on, Mike. No, go, on, go on, mate. No, I was just going to say it's the intangibles as well that that, like you said about Gary Harris, the things that he does that don't show up on the box score. Yeah. It's those differences that I think have shone out, shone more between in the comparisons between Wendell and Mo. Like, I don't notice what Wendell's doing when he's not doing it, if you know what I mean. Whereas Mo, I always feel like, and this is not, this is not meant to be me Mo bashing because I really think that he's got the opportunity to kind of develop in something. He's just not there yet, but he always looks confused on offense. He, the lost. thing that. Yeah. He, thing that really frustrates me so often is he's looking away from the ball like he's he's clearly goes he runs to the offensive end and then he's running around looking to try and screen someone and there's sort of like the the guards behind him like waiting for him or something and and he's running to the corner trying to get a screen for T Ross or what have you and there's he's like T Ross I've not even been marked there's nobody here pal do you know what I mean he's just running around let me screen someone let me screen someone and but but Wendell Carter just seems to have a much kind of more advanced grasp of of kind of well this stage of his career anyway and how good are those screens that Wendell sets yeah Ken Birch screen oh, yeah. Mate, I mean, there's a guy still trying to pick himself up off the floor from that screen earlier on in the week. Yeah. <laughs> that was a big hit. <laughs> that yeah. was a really good yeah. hit. Jonesy, any uh, any thoughts? Yeah. Well, I think the boys have covered um, Wendell Carter in great depth, haven't they? Um, so I, I'll go with somebody else, uh, somebody we just signed this week, Dante Hall. Um, now, he yeah. came in yeah. uh, in that game in midweek and... He's wearing number 45, uh, like Mr. Charles out, Charles Bo Outlaw. Um, and he was exactly like Bo Outlaw. Um, you know, crashing the glass, uh, just doing the intangibles, things that don't appear on the box score, um, dirty work, your proper junkyard dog. And, you know, we're going to need those sort of players. So, you know, in these last 20 games, if he can stick on a team, uh, come in. He's been given an opportunity before. I think he was at Brooklyn, uh, the summer league, not the summer league, in the in the bubble last year. He was. Uh, but he didn't stick there. So if we can pick someone up like him, who's you know going to be a couple of guys off the bench next season, uh, retaining, come in, block a few shots, get the energy going, get the bench all pumped up, fired up, um, then he could be a great asset to us. Um, so. He was my, um, you know, star, not star, but um, someone to talk player. about this standout. No, it's not standout, though, is it? Because the boys have already covered Wendell right. Carter because he's right. They're, they're, they're right, I mean. Um, but but my- on, on the Mobamba front, the game on the Sunday, when he did score those 21 points, shooting the lights out, I thought he played very well. So I was really annoyed to see him go down injured. So, um, you know, if he can fulfil what he can do, um, then we've got two potentially great centres there, so we'll see. You know, I've never been over high on Mo. I've never been convinced by him. Um, it's nice to Wait hear somebody else it. come out. Wait it's for nice it. To, mate, it's nice to come, hear somebody else come out with the same sort of stuff I've always been saying. What I will say, and what I have said on a couple of other things, is that my opinion of Mo is changing. Since Booch went, he's looking a lot happier and he's seeming to contribute more. 
Um, he's not there yet. He isn't making the strides that we've seen from Wendell, but he is starting to change my opinion. And Dante Hall, you're absolutely right. Um, to come in less than about 24 hours after having been signed, no practice time, mm. and knock in, was it seven points, two assists? Nine uh, rebounds, com- I think. Nine rebounds, yeah. Blocks. And he also, a couple of blocks and a steal. That's fantastic return. He, he deserves credit. He's, yeah. he's got the potential to be like a classic Orlando pickup. Like we've got yeah. a bit of a pedigree with getting these kind of these kind of bigs out of nowhere that then carve yeah. themselves out a really nice career. We did it with marching Ben Gort- Wallace, Dwayne Deadman, yeah, um, yes. Gortat and um, Ken Birch. All these kind of unfancied big men that are kind of low skill, high energy types, and then carve out a really nice career for himself. So, like you say, we would not be surprised at all if we kind of he, we we picked him up in the summer. Were any of you in agreement with the rest of the Magic Twitter on uh, Sunday last week that apparently compared Mo to Dwight Howard? <laughs> Did you see any of those comparisons? What? I'm not quite sure no. I'd go there, but there was, I'm, I'm pretty sure there was something like that floating around. So, um, no, I don't think we agree with that. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think. Like, I mean, this sounds like I'm, it really does sound like I'm Mo bashing. We know that he's, I mean, he's a seven footer with, with 28 foot wingspan that can, shoot the outside shot like in theory he is the modern nba in a capsule but he's also got to be able to get up and down the floor and set decent screens and 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 know what he's doing he's also he's also got to want to do it yeah and this is the thing is like we 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 view these people as like these athletes name on a stat sheet we see him on the on every game but he's what is he 21 22 year old yeah 22 year old millionaire um, and six pick. I mean, I don't even know what is he on seven mil a year, is he? About is, he, About is that, that yeah. seven, eight mil, yeah. Yeah, so his fourth year will be he'll be seven mil at twenty-two and he's not achieved anything in the game yet. Like we don't know what what that's like. How do you sort of like he could be a role player for the rest of his life and he'll be set. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. you've got to have that mentality. And if he's not, that's fine, but he just doesn't reach the ceiling we all want him to have. So after the uh, one in three week, the Magic are now 18 and 38, 14th in the Eastern Conference with the fourth worst record in the NBA. Um, We are four games ahead of Houston, who've got the worst record, three and a half games ahead of Minnesota and one and a half games ahead of Detroit, which looks like we might just catch them for that third worst record. We'll see. Um, As things stand, the Magic have a 12 and a half percent chance of the first overall pick and a 48 0.1% 0.1% chance of a top four pick. Um, injury updates. Um, just before we jumped on, I had a ch- quick check. Uh, Josh Robbins tweeted that Michael Carter Williams and Otto Porter are both out for tonight for the game against the Rockets. Um, and James Ennis and Mo Bamba are questionable. Um, so moving on to our next section is a bit of a throwback. So for those who are watching on YouTube, the, uh, the three of us are all rocking our, uh, 2019 blue and white ignite playoff t-shirts um so two years tomorrow um the magic played game three against the raptors in the in the playoffs which the three of us were really lucky to to go to um so i'm going to ask you guys for like memories and and sort of walk walk yourself through and any the emotions that you went through um paul i'm going to start with you mate um starting with that boston game and then any sort of standouts from, from our trip when we went away? Mate, the Boston game was insane, really. Um, you know, we'd been we'd been talking about it for weeks. Uh, if it happens, are we going? Are we going? For it to happen, for us to get qualified there against Boston and playing such a good game, um, it, it just ignited the trip, correct? It, it put it right. No pun intended. It really did. It, no, it was deliberate. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it really, it, it, it just put it right to start with that this is going to be exciting. We qualified in an exciting way. It was what ten days before we actually flew out, mm. something of that nature. Mm-hmm. Um, I know I landed a day or so before you guys. Uh, I was there for. I landed on day of game two, uh, went down to the ESPN bar at Disney Boardwalk to watch it, and I sat watching the game uh, with. 
Joanne and Heather, obviously we're in magic gear. And there's three lads to the side of us at a different table, all in Raptors gear. Um, so you get talking, don't you? Are you are you here for games three and four? These lads had not planned this trip right. They were in Orlando for games one and two and back home for games three and four. I'm not I'm no genius, but I know that the uh seeded team get home home advantage first. So they had organized their they had they literally had landed in Orlando for games one and two, which were in Toronto. Well played, lads. They were they actually confessed they were quite worried by us. Um they felt that we were being underestimated by uh the NBA media and by Toronto fans, they felt that we could actually mash up well against them. Um, what we'd gone two and two with them in that season. So, uh, <laughs> game two sort of was a bit of a deflation, wasn't it? Let's be honest. After the heights of DJ knocking in that three, but <sighs> to be in Orlando for it was fantastic. I mean, I loved everywhere that you went. There was blue and white ignite or magic banners just around the team. To be wearing magic gear and somebody, the people stopping and talking to you in a positive manner, actually wanting to talk about the team was great. Um, game three was on Good Friday. We had a cracking time. Um, unbelievable atmosphere. Uh, you know, there was the pre game interview and all those sorts of things that we had. Um, Steve Francis was there, T Mac. Jermaine Nelson, he was only a, Jermaine Nelson was about four rows in front of us. Um, the, I think, I think we got written up incorrectly as to. I read at the time that the score flattered us that Toronto won that game easily. I well, think game up, three, game three, game three. No, I yeah, think, they, no, I don't think that at all. They, when you look at it, what with um, we were thirteen points down going into the fourth quarter. I know that they played really well to start, but we we were we were in that fight and we got it down to being within three points, an opportunity to score in the last minute, and then I think Kawhi sunk two free throws, didn't he, to win the game? We can bash him um, out if Evan Fournier had knocked down some threes, we'd have been a lot closer. <laughs> but for me, that atmosphere in Game Three was unreal. It was so so good. I know that we we read at the time again people saying, that, oh, you know every other arena is really noisy, and then this the the Amway was so quiet. You had I to know. be there. I'm sorry, if that clearly didn't come across on the TV, because that was loud and it was very very partisan crowd. It there was no, you know, well, you go to you go to the Amway normally, and it's a mixture of home and away fans and folks sitting there rocking. Lakers shirts just because they're there on holiday. This was a magic crowd and it was really partisan. It was really raucous. I thought game three was amazing. Four, yeah. We we went in very hopeful after the efforts, didn't we? After the efforts of game three, we went in very hopeful. We felt that we we'd got a chance. Yeah, we were 16 points down by the end of the first half, weren't we? And uh, mm. the the air had been took out of the building. And as we walked as as the team walked off below us. Uh, at the end of the game, we knew that that series was over. We weren't we weren't taking another result in in Toronto. You could see the guys were deflated, but what a trip! I loved it. We, yeah. we it was so good to meet so many people. Yeah, um, and one yeah. thing I know we know this because we talked to Sabrina when we were there. But after Game Three, the Raptors actually made a complaint to the NBA of how loud the Amway was for Game Three, and we had bam bams and the little drums and all that sort of stuff going in. Game four, they didn't give us any of that because they didn't want the loud, they didn't want the noise to be quite as loud as it was in game three. But yeah, gee, you were up with me, mate, for the week, weren't you? Who shared? I was. Shared a little romantic hotel room for the week. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it was um, superb uh, experience. It was just the anticipation, wasn't it? You know, the build up to where um, you and I checked into, you know, the Premier Inn when we went to Gatwick. Um, went down to the sports bar, both in our magic jackets, and uh, we bumped into someone and goes, Go magic! and you're like, We it started already. Um, and we get to Orlando, we bump, we see Paul, we see Luke, Louise, uh, Schmeichel, 
uh, Daniel, Rihanna, um, Deb, um, Jeannie, everybody, yep. um, you know, that we got to meet in the pub beforehand. Um, it was just a magic, pardon the pun, a magical, uh, you know, experience, wasn't it? And much like what Paul's just described there, you know, the, the Amway said it was absolutely bouncing. Uh, hairs on the back of your neck stand up. Um, and it, it, if you get to go to a game, you want to go to a playoff game as opposed to a regular season game. Um, regular season games, of course, are less expensive and, you know, they're, they're scheduled. Uh, but if you can get to a playoff game, I would absolutely recommend it. Just hopefully next time we get a W instead of um, two losses. But couldn't fault the performances of the guys. They tried their best. And, and we've heard in the media, you know, they were so excited. You see that interview with Fournier and Vucevic, and that's been played recently since the guys have been traded. You know, they really wanted to get one for the home fans. Uh, it's just a shame they didn't. But um, oh, let's just hope we get another one soon and we can uh, start planning an next trip. There's, there's one funny non-magic story from that trip. So in the, the day, do you remember the day in between games three and four? And we went down, we went into downtown Orlando, Orlando City. No, no, Orlando oh, yeah. City. we went to, we went to Orlando City. But your face, because I'm, you guys know I'm a big Liverpool fan, and uh, they were oh, playing. Was it Everton? I can't remember who we played. No, no it was, we were playing you. No, we played Cardiff. You played Cardiff. Sorry, oh, I don't know. I forgot that that little. Uh, yeah, so that was Liverpool the morning play... of game four, mate. That was Liverpool, the morning mate, of game it's four. Under, it's understandable. They're not. In, they're not in the Premiership, are you? You can still forget them. So Liverpool yeah, played no. Cardiff. <laughs> We've been back we, uh... one season. Don't take that. <laughs> back one season. We've not even seen it in person yet. We can't take that. So we so we head up. Everybody hates Leeds. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So we head to the bar in downtown Orlando, and there's the whole Liverpool, the whole Orlando Liverpool supporters group in this bar with about 50 people in it. And G sat next to these two Everton fans who are just sat there ribbing the rest of us for 90 minutes. You're th you're punching the bar and you're getting angry because Liverpool scored. That was that was quite funny. All this allowed for nothing, if I remember rightly. Yeah, that sounds so, uh, about yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, VAR, mate. VAR again. It's supposed to be yeah. a referee and decision shocker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. Ian, have you got any any memories from, from that? I know you didn't come with us, but you obviously watched get, watched all that, that the playoff series. Um, yeah. Obviously, we didn't have Bamba and, and Faults. That was one thing that we, we could take away going into the following season. Did you feel like we... We we had we sort of started to discover something then, and obviously injuries and that sort of derailed it a little bit. But we had a lot of hope, didn't we, going yeah, into the following year? It was interesting because I, I remember feeling quite like I think like like Paul mentioned. I felt like um, obviously you go in as an eight seed, you're under the radar, but I felt a lot more confident in our chances than anyone else outside of the Orlando community did. I think. Um, like you say, we've matched up with them pretty well. And I think J.I. had given them given them some problems in the past. Um, and so when we got that game one win, when DJ got the three, um, that was amazing. That was that that was absolutely fantastic, especially because they had they had all their people in Jurassic in Jurassic Park, whatever. <laughs> they, were all, they were all in Jurassic Park, just stood there watching DJ sing for three. That was absolutely brilliant. Um so I was hopeful coming back home at one all. You, you're hopeful that if you can get get a game sort of thing, then then you can then you can do something. But I, as, as, although it was close, I never really felt like we looked like causing them any any real problems in, in three and four. Like I think this is, and then that's what playoff basketball is, isn't it? I think we essentially had boot because Evan Evan didn't turn up really, um, and they were able to. Jeans just getting redder and redder like that. <laughs> We've got another one bashing Evan again. <laughs> but, but they were able to smother Vooch, and we we didn't have anything anything to be able to to beat them over seven games. So, um, but I remember it, obviously kind of you guys being over there and stuff. It was really amazing. Listen, listening to what listening to what G said then as well. I was wondering what you guys think in terms of like where you stand on the argument of 
you were saying how amazing that playoff experience was in the atmosphere at the Amway and it was, they were complaining about how loud it was and stuff. But where do you stand then on the argument of being a kind of perennial meddling playoff team in the seventh and eighth seed, but never going to be threatening to a title versus chip, cashing in the chips, bottoming out, bottoming out to try and start again? Like Because that's obviously kind of where... Charlotte, Chicago, Indiana type teams are now sort of thing. They're, they're going to be in that six to eight, six to ten spot over and over again, but they're not going to threaten a title. Um, and obviously we've kind of drawn our line in the sand now to kind of hopefully accelerate our future prospects and stuff. But I've not experienced a, a game three playoff game at, at Orlando. You guys have. Would you say if you can get playoff basketball every year and experience it, take it. No, no. You, you, you want to build a contender. You want to build a championship team. And it was a nice experience. And, you know, it's going to help some of the players come along. Um, but I think the, t- the team did the right thing in cashing in. The ceiling was, you know, with Vucevic, Fournier, Gordon. It was, if we could got, got to the second round, it would have been seen as a success. That's not a championship. We're not going to get a banner for, you know, getting into the second round. Um, you know, you look at maybe like a bad example, maybe, but the Boston Brit uh, in the UK community, they're just talking about banners and championships and everything all the time. And, you know, it's boring because it's Boston. Um, <laughs> but no, but that's what we, we, sh- we should be. Um, you know, we want to, we want a banner. We, we don't yeah. want to get it to the second round, do we? So, the right thing is to, to tear it down and to start again and try and unearth that, you know, star in the draft. And hopefully, you know, touch wood, we got a chance this year. So, um, and the cap flexibility. And if somebody wants to come and play with Fultz, J.I. and whoever else we draft, then we've got the flexibility now. So, you know, let's get the wheels into motion and uh, crack on. That experience is important for young players. Like you think yeah. yep. how, imp- how good Isaac was in game three to start that game. Um, but I think it's all right saying what if, but if the magic had say cap space after that summer that they could add to it rather than hoping that a young player can continue to develop and there's a path forward that we kind of got stuck that way. Didn't we? I think you said it before. Um, yeah. Were we six highest payroll and yeah. you know, we, we were shackled. Uh, there was no way of manoeuvring t- to try and gather some extra talent. You know, we weren't even, um, we couldn't even be buyers at the, the the trade deadline. You know, we didn't have anything to offer. We had no expiring deals to move. Well, not this year, we were Fournier, but um, in years gone by. So, um, no, that's everything. I think, I think that it would have been lovely to see where we could have gone this year had it not been for the injuries. Because I, I think we would have been more of a threat this year. I think we could well have got further. And I think that the more the more playoff experience you get, the better it is for the players. You also become more attractive for um, other players to want to come to a team. Right. But the problem was we just didn't have any availability to move anybody, as G's just said. Um, you know, so yeah, I was quite happy with the decision to blow things up. And it actually leads me into where I was going to ask you, Ian. I know you've kind of touched on it because I wanted to know what your reaction to trade deadline day was and how you feel now and where whether you felt it was the right decision to press the red button and uh, blow it up. I think like everyone, I think I was I was surprised at the Vooch one. I think the other two had been well publicised. We, it was a case of if we were going to get... The, the Evan thing was if we were going to get anything of value versus was it worth keeping him for the year. Um, AG wanted out, so so he was likely going to go. Didn't really expect the Vooch one. It's, I think it was the timing of it as well, because the Vooch was the one that was announced first. If the other two had have gone, then you could have seen like, well, what's the point of keeping Vooch now? But obviously, in in the front office timeline, they were obviously working on all of them. But in terms of how we processed it, it was tweet notification, and it was Vooch has gone, and it's like, oh my god, this is happening. Um, and it's just like like you were saying then about no flexibility and stuff. And I agree. I was hopeful coming into this season. Like I, I thought we could challenge the six and five seed, JI make a make a step and 
bolts make a step and all, all the things that you hope for every year. But even if that had have happened, and like G said, we get past the first round in a, in a miraculous season or what have you, all that happens is we've reached our ceiling and we don't get as much for it next year. So we would be in that situation. We would have had this nice playoff experience, but what we would have, what we've just done, we would have had to have done next year. Trade AG, trade Vooch, trade Evan, and we wouldn't have got what we've got for it this year. So I think I think they've they've made the decision that is in the best interests of the franchise. Um, we're relying on ping pong balls, and I already feel sick about it. To be honest with you, it already makes me feel physically ill. Um, I've done one draft simulator, and I got a little bit of bile in my mouth because we got the ninth pick. <laughs> so, um, so I, I just, I just, I just hate it. I can't, I can't, I can't let it happen. We've got, we've got to get a top four pick. We've got to, um, and I'm scared that we're not going to. But um, it, it's the right move. But we're relying on, we're rely, relying on lottery luck and. And going back to 93, we did it twice on the bounce, got the number one pick. Um, we did it in 06, was it, with Dwight? 04, 03, 04. 03, 04, 04. 03, 04. got it with Dwight. I mean, that, when you look back at that draft, that is so, that could have gone so wrong. Because at the time, there was, it wasn't one of those where there was an outright number one. It was a Mecca Okafor or it was Dwight. Mm-hmm. And there was, you get the seasoned, Four-year college player, decorated in a Mecca Oka for really solid, ready to play. Or you get the kid straight out of high school who's an athletic freak. Um, nobody knew. Come pick time, Orlando Magic on the clock. Still didn't know. Um, and then, and they made they made the right choice. Um, there have been a few wobbly ones since then, but hopefully, come June, we're celebrating our new cornerstone. Yeah, which leads me on. Um... Ian, so which player from the current roster do you see as the franchise cornerstone? Oh, you said the same word, man. Brilliant. Um, it was in the script, mate. <laughs> There's, a script. There's a script. Yeah, um, no, this is scripted. <laughs> There's no spontaneity here. <laughs> so you all just wear those t-shirts just randomly anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, I like your T-shirt, G. That's good, isn't it? <laughs> um, franchise, franchise cornerstone. Um, the current roster. We're already... This is the other scary thing as well as lottery balls. Is we don't know. The two, the two guys are a Fultz and Isaac, and we don't know what versions we're going to get back, which is equally scary. Um, I think we're all kind of trying to hope, glass half full, that they become the full versions of, of what they were and, and beyond. It's got to be Isaac, I think. For me, he's, um, he's, he's already defensively elite. And I think most people in Orlando could see the progress he was making offensively, even if the rest of the league hadn't caught up yet, which I think was the case. I think his, his mid-range shot is consistent. Um, he was starting to look a lot more comfortable with the three. Um, and he was even, I mean, was it last summer when, when T. Ross re- referred to him in, in, the, uh, in the summer as like a like giraffe galloping down court or something like that? Like, <laughs> how do you guard that? He's just all arms and legs, but he's like the speed of a gazelle. Um, so if he, can be, if he can be what we want him to be, it's got to be J.I. Equally, if Markel can, can start getting back to the... Washington State Markel and hit the outside shot, then he could quite easily be be the guy. But this is why I think we're all so positive about the future because if these if these things if these things come off and we get a decent draft pick, then the foundation is there. I mentioned mentioned to Michael the other day that our foundation for this rebuild is so much higher than any of the other rebuilds in the past. You know what I mean? We're not relying on mm. Mo Harkless and Trevor Ariza. We're We've already got two, two, two people in place now that if they if they come back from injury, a, a good version of themselves, then we've got a bright future. I think. Cool. So, mate, yeah, I I quite agree. I think uh, you had Wendell in there alongside of uh, 
Jonathan Isaac, and that could be really exciting. Yeah. So, mate, that leads on to what do you want to see for the rest of the season from this team? Um, just more of the same, really. I don't think we can question the effort since it's been quite refreshing. It's been a bit of a throwback to the kind of heart and hustle, kind of all gut, no ability kind of approach. <laughs> um, but it's the the defence has really picked up. It's been really good to see, like, we're back to that kind of where we were before and where we were last season. There's, there's a lot of defensive activity, which is really impressive considering the change in personnel and so many young players. But it'd be nice to see the young guys that we're also hopeful of kind of step out, like Hampton. It'd be nice to see him to get some consistent minutes, 20-plus a game and get more comfortable. Tumor's looking better every single every single week. Um I think it was Josh Robbins that said in an article recently that um, he's probably the most accomplished offensive player that we've drafted in quite some time at this stage of his career, which I think is is fair. We've kind of always drafted these raw, rangy kind of athletic types uh, that have got a limited offensive skill set that you hope we grow into, whereas Tuma seems to be kind of comfortable. And he's, he's already further on now than he was in the beginning of the season. So if kind of his trajectory continues, that could be really positive. So I think I don't I don't I don't hope for, for losses, but I don't really hope for wins. <laughs> so if if we try hard and narrowly lose every game then so be it. <laughs> sort of so you 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 kind of wanted to see that bit more of the continuity, a few bit of cohesion between from the players again. Yeah, I mean, I don't really know how many will return next year. Like, the, the vets that are, are so vital to kind of the development of the young guys, like the James Ennis's and, and what have you, and MCW, I think they'll have a market in the summer. James Ennis is going to be a uh, free agent, isn't he? Um, or is, he got, is, it, is it a player option or is it a team option? Ennis is a free agent, yeah. Is he? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean... Arthur even... Williams is signed through two years, I think. So, oh, this year and next. I think there'll be a market for him though, um, if 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 the Orlando wanted to kind of cash in at all. But yeah, I think I think integrating a culture with with the vets, I think T Ross, MCW, James Ennis, kind of instilling a bit of culture with with the young guys, um, and a bit of playing time consistency. I, I know it's been difficult this season because of all the injuries, and, and I think Cliff is clearly now trying to give the young guys some. Um, some time, uh, your mate, your uh, your brother, brother Bacon, um, he's, cousin, cousin Dwayne, cousin Dwayne <laughs> is uh, is sliding down to the end of the bench. It's uh, getting a bit slippery down there. So um, uh, yeah, I think th those kind of moves have, been, have obviously been enforced slightly by by the moves and from the front office. But we just need to get the young guys some time and see what we've got, really. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, talking of uh, NBA vets, former Magic player JJ Redick was on this week's pod squad with Dante and Galante, um, and he got posed the question, which team was better? Was it the 2009 finals team or was it the 2010 team? What do you think? Uh, I think, I don't know. I think there's a general consensus that it's 10, isn't there? But... Um, it is. <laughs> it is, yeah. It has to be. There's no comparison. You think? I yeah. don't know. Yeah. The the Vince Carter. Team. It's not that the finals, obviously the finals team is pretty good. And but and this always won. goes, this always goes amiss. Like, everyone always remembers LeBron's buzzer beater in game two when we beat the Cavs in that series. But had that not gone in, we could have very easily have swept the Cavs in that season, in, in that series. Probably well, we would have. We would have. We were was, three wide It was a good team. We were not. It, it was a bit like maybe not the Raptors series, but we weren't four. They weren't four gate four one better than us, were they? Um, we had game three. Game four went to overtime. Um, yeah, it was. Don't forget though, but Jimmy was injured as well. Like yeah. Jimmy was an all star that season. We had Dwight and Jameer that both made the all-star team and Jameer didn't play because he hurt his shoulder. And then we had to trade for Ray Peralston who, who kind of plugged the gap. But G 
Jameer was having a career year. If he'd have, if he'd have stayed fit, then who knows? But I suppose that's the question, isn't it? What was better, the ten team or the team that finished out ninth? But um, I'll um, I'll bow to peer pressure then and say ten guys, whatever, I don't know. <laughs> whatever you say. Why don't you ask me? Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, Not really well, allowed to 20... opinion, were you? <laughs> No, no, sorry, but the 2010 team, they had that scoring wing in Vince Carter as well, someone who's going to take attention from Dwight, from Jameer, from Rashad, so you'd have a lot more open shots. We also got um, Ryan Anderson in the trade as well, so again, floor spacer. Um, and what, we do, what did we trade in the end? Courtney Lee and Ray for Alston, so, and, and Tony Petit, but no, the 2010 team, other than the two games against Boston in the Eastern Finals, they steamrolled the uh, the Bobcats and the Hawks, four nil, four nil in the uh, first two rounds. And it wasn't just for the fact that we had ten days off between game w- one and the previous series. You know, we would have probably steamrolled Boston as well. But there we go. But then the thing is, in that was our year. Ten, the target was on your back because you were the finals team the year before, so yeah. you weren't so much as you weren't as surprised as much as you were the year before. White chocolate's also okay. another one that goes missing in that 2010 team. Great shout. He was another one. Yeah. Um, right. So you've been a fan all this time. So if you could pick three different magic jerseys from the team that's ever worn, uh, so you'd have one black, one blue, one white, or you know, if you want to chuck in a city one in there, what are your three favorite combinations that you'd go with, you know, for next season if you could? Um, I uh, I think the black pinstripes, the original black pinstripes, um, is is I think is that's my favourite. Um, I love the the blue stars jersey. I know that I know that the kind of the consensus is that the blue pinstripes is the pinstripes is where it's at. But I think the blue stars jersey is is underrated, um, and. I actually like, I mean, I like this one. I like the White Stars jersey. Um, do you like this one, Mikey? You know, do you like, do you like, do you like this one? <laughs> it's, not one it's not got Tracy on the back, so it's all right. It's cool. <laughs> um, but um, I also like that uh, Dwight Rookie Year uh, white jersey. The, the like, plain one. Yeah, the crisp the plain one, one yeah. with, the, with the star on the V. Yeah. Um, I quite like that the one. Chest. Yeah. Um, I, uh, just for a bit of variety, I do I do that. I do the black pins, the blue stars, and then the that's, yeah. It's those yeah. ones, but I've got it turned the other way. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, yeah, I think that'd be my three. We've had some good ones. We've had cool. some really good ones, just none of them at the minute. <laughs> <laughs> so last question then. So if you had to start your own franchise, which single player, past or present, magic former magic players present. Would you build your team around if you could pick one player and why? For a team that's never won the title, we've had a lot of Hall of Famers, um, a lot of good players. Got oh man, this is hard. Shaq, Dwight, T Mac, Penny. That's your Mount Rushmore, I guess, isn't it? Um, yeah. But I. Penny's my guy. Penny, Penny was Penny was the reason that I got into it. Um, even in a world when we had Shaq at the time, um, I just think he was a genius with the ball. And injuries ruined his his career. I mean, who knows what would have happened? I mean, it's depressing to think, isn't it, if we'd have if we'd have beaten Houston in '95? But um, I, I I think he could have been the heir apparent to MJ with a title dynasty with Orlando and Jack. Um, obviously, left under a bit of a cloud, which taints his legacy slightly, um, I think. But in terms of on the court, and, and I think his game suits suits the modern era as well. Um, he wasn't a sharp shooter, but he could hit the, out, hit the outside shot, but could do everything that Ben Simmons could do and a million things more as well. Hmm. Guys, you got any thoughts? Paul? I wouldn't disagree with Ian. I've got to be honest, mate. Would not disagree. Not at all. G? No. Um, if I was picking somebody, it would be Tracy McGrady. 
to get that scoring, you know, we were watching those teams back, and Mike, you'll know this because it's when he started following the Magic. You'd put the Magic game on, and McGrady would get at least 30, if not 40, sometimes close to 50, and one time 60. Was it 62 in Washington? Yeah. So it was... And the team he had around him, it wasn't the best. It was a bunch of, you know, Grant Hill, mm-hmm. unfortunately, was injured. Um, it's unfortunate, really, because John Gabriel did such a sterling job of freeing up cap space, signing two max free agents, uh, getting Grant Hill, who was the number one, him and Duncan, uh, with the best free agents out there, and getting T-Mac, who was almost like a consolation at the time, but he came out and he was absolutely fantastic. Um so, no, T-Mac every day. Um, Shaq was great. Penny was fantastic as well. Uh, Dwight Howard. Okay, uh, let's move on from there. But <laughs> and I could mention Nick Anderson, but I won't because McGrady right. was head and shoulders in terms of scoring potential. He, he was up there with, you know, with Kobe Bryant. So, no, Tracy McGrady. Mate, I would have gone for T-Mac had it not been for the conversation we had with Nick, who said exactly what Ian did, that had it not been for injury, then he would have been up there with MJ. That's yeah. the reason I went there. Ian Nick, by the way, like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did I show you his Christmas card that he sent earlier in the year? I probably went <laughs> around here somewhere. You know? That's nice. I'm pleased. I'm pleased he's been in touch with you, mate. That's nice been mate. Yeah, oh, he's yeah. on WhatsApp though. It's a bit annoying. Do you know what I mean? All right, Nick's yeah. at it again. <laughs> Love it. So you'd think that I would go T Mac, but I'm actually going to say Shaq. Now it's before my time. Mm-hmm. Right. And the only reason is he's the only one of the four who was a key part of winning a title. If you win a, if you want to win a ring, Shaq should go. That's, what, that's all I'm going to say. All right. Cool. Good argument, mate. That's all I'll say on that. Why right. did he leave? Why oh. did he leave? Why did he leave? <laughs> <laughs> so um, our next episode, um, we are recording on Saturday, the 24th of April, where we're hoping, I think it's all scheduled, Paul, isn't it? We're going to have George Galante on. um, It is scheduled, we'll see. So that's going to be our next guest. Um, Before then, we've got uh, three more games. Um, This week, obviously, the Magic went one in three. Me and G got this week right, or somewhat right. I said we beat the Spurs, and that couldn't have been further from the truth. But (laughs) who did you say, G? I said we beat the Chicago Bulls. I got it spot on. So do I get an extra point for having it... No, absolutely no, 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 definitely not. Um, well, I'm still winning though, aren't I? Five, three, three, no, no five. Yeah, yeah, but your, you, yeah, yeah, but your streak was broken the other week. <laughs> oh, bacon buns, <laughs> bacon buns. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Light, light them up. Quality. It's got to be done. I can see. I can see. I'm down the council offices <laughs> with changing my name by default. Something else. <laughs> <laughs> oh man it's got to be done Paul it's got to be done hey wait um, I've told you before if you're not taking the mickey I think you fell out with me yeah exactly exactly <laughs> um you went two and two last week with Hank um yes so what's that so make close. it now five four and four so you've got five so, and you, two of us have got four I think this week this season I think it's actually there's G said five three and three. Oh, was it yeah we'll yeah. add it on because we'll he, he took he took he took the lead last week when he got it right. <laughs> we'll let him have it. We'll let him have it. Um, so tonight, the uh, Magic play the Rocket. So when you're listening to this, you'll likely know the outcome because um, this is probably going to go up on some point on Monday. Um, so the Magic are playing the Rockets, 14 and 42. Worst record in the league. Um, it's a midnight tip-off. Um, they've lost the last five games um, and they've got John Wall who's sitting out amongst whoever else. So it's going to be who can out-tank each other for tonight. Um, they then need we... to be careful. The NBA is going to find them. Well, this... it, it actually took me longer writing their injuries <laughs> on the game preview than it did the fit players. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's... 
they, they've got a stamp down on it somewhere, but unless they're going to start finding teams on 25 grand, they're going to keep doing it, aren't they? So the is, everyone's yeah. going to literally, for the rest of the season, everyone's going to rest their players against us because yep. we're, we're there for the taking, aren't they? So they're going to think, yep. oh, we can rest them against Orlando. And and the teams that like, like, like Houston and Detroit and stuff like, we can't win against Orlando. We need to lose. So, um, yeah, we're just going to be seeing D-leaguers for the rest of the, G-leaguers yep. for the rest of the season, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. And then on Tuesday night, the Magic play the 13-26 Atlanta Hawks, who've won seven of the last 10 games. Um, that's a 12 or a half past midnight tip off in the UK. Um, and then on Thursday, we got the 25 and 31 Pelicans. Uh, that's a midnight tip off. They are one and a half games back of San Antonio for 10th in the West um, in the final playoff spot. Um, the Magic have actually won five straight. Um, but will we see Zion Williamson play us for the first time this week? We will see. So, predictions, boys. I'm going to start with Ian, seeing as he's our guest. What are you going with? Uh, one and two. I think. I think we'll beat. I think we'll beat Houston tonight. Um, uh, I'm relatively comfortably. I'm quite. Com- I'm quite confident about tonight. I've got. I've got no doubts that it will be a rousing victory for the uh, for the Magic. Uh, Atlanta. Yeah, I just think we're going to lose. I think we're going to lose the next two. Um, I'm, I'm really intrigued to see, like you say, about Zion uh, against New Orleans, who we would put on him. I know there's been this whole point Zion thing. It'd be int- I'd love to see J.I. deal with him, see how that matchup would go, but I suspect it might be Tumor, maybe James Ennis. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure, but it's it's really interesting to see how, how Tumor as a rookie is going to deal with someone like like Zion. I'd, be, I'd, I'd, I'd hope he does play just to see that kind of uh, play out. I'm going to go G. What are you going with? Uh, yeah, one and two. Uh, I don't. I don't know how you could lose to Houston. Let's be honest. They've got barely a team. Um, and as you said earlier, Bamba might not play. Ennis might not play. But we should have enough there to beat them. And these guys are professionals and. You know, it's their job to try and win basketball games. So I think we'll beat them. Um, and you've got Atlanta playing very well. No, I, don't, I can't see that one. And New Orleans with all their, you know, Ingram, Zion back. Uh, we got lucky, I think, a couple of weeks ago. So, uh, no, one and two. I feel like we're all going to agree because I'm going one and two. We're going to beat Houston. <laughs> so, Paul, you're going different. Two and one. Two and one. I think we beat the Rockets. Um, I mean, I know that they obliterated us by 42 points earlier in the season. That it was at one, but for quite a length of time, it was uh, the most points we'd conceded in the season. It was the biggest margin of defeat of the season. But that was a different team. It's not what we're facing tonight. So we beat the Rockets, the Hawks. The season series is often split two and two, um, but I, I don't see that this time round. Um, I think that they will have too much for us. So I think we lose that one. And the Pelicans are one of those teams that we always play well against. We just seem to match up really well with them. I think we beat them. So we're 2 1. Good man. Good man. Right. We're going to finish off with a quick bit of magic trivia. Now, there's a slight spin off to this week. Okay. We're going to carry on playing Who Am I? Oh and I will say to you, one of these players is a current magic player, the other two are passed, but there is a link to all three, which you will find out at the end. All right? They're all types of bacon. <laughs> <laughs> Streaky, crispy, and smoky. There you go. Bob Prosciutto, drafted in 1985. <laughs> <laughs> Quality. So, um, Ian's going to get the first pick. So, you're going to go A, B, or C, and then I'll give you five facts for that player, and then you can have a guess who it might be. Uh, B for me, please. B, okay, right. For first, bacon. First, <laughs> first oh, clue. Oh, dear. I have two middle names, James and a liar. Feel free to contribute more. <laughs> okay, right. Second one. I played 394 games for the Toronto Raptors. Right. Next. 
This yeah. might might give it. I am the first player in NBA history to score 50 points in a game while averaging fewer than 10 a game at the time. G's nodding his Got head. Got it. Got it. Oh, T. Ross. There you go. Yes. There you go. The other two, I played 254 games for the Magic and I won the Slam Dunk Contest in 2013. Right, Mr. Bacon, A or C? Oh, Lord. You've got to go for A because you're trying to spell bacon. B and A. <laughs> well, I'm going to see that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, let's see how you get on with this. I have made oh, NBA All Defense first team three times. Go on. I have won a gold medal at Eurobasket in 2011. Um, who won it? Now go on. Okay, I played two hundred and ninety-three games for the Toronto Raptors. I feel like I should get you to that. Boom. Now go on, carry on. <laughs> Next one. I was selected 24th overall by the Seattle Supersonics in 2008. That's not going to help me. Both of you still look confused as well. Right, last no, I one. I got it. I played just 56 played... games for the Orlando Magic. No, I got it. No, mate, I think you've done me today. Done that? That's a hard one. Ian? No, I don't think so. Go on, G. Oh, I'm so pleased. Jeff Green? No. Is it not? No. Serge Ibaka? Oh, oh okay. I've, I've written him out of magic history. <laughs> you'll That's see why there's... really well for me. You'll see why there's... I, I, yeah, I could... I, as I said, you know when you said about the Eurobasket, I felt I should have got it then, like, yes. Sorry. That's where I should have got it from. Okay. I was so G A then for you. Yeah. I was drafted seventh overall by the Sacramento Kings in 2011. Seventh overall, 2011. Oh my god, it's going back a bit. Um, and this guy's played for the Magic. Mm -hmm. I have played for Steve Clifford. Okay, he's been on the Hornets then. Bismarck Biombo. Oh, he's got it. Yeah. He's straight in there. The other three were I played 102 games for the Toronto Raptors. I signed a four year, $72 million contract in 2016. And I played 163 games for the Magic. So, you know what? I really wish I'd gone with A because I could have got that one. <laughs> I'd, have got, I'd have got that one at the same point as G did the Steve Flipper bit. There you go. That'll teach me, that'll go. Teach me to be rebellious. <laughs> So Why what you your nose off to spite your face? <laughs> I did, I did, mate. I, did. <laughs> I certainly did. Brilliant. So what the three could, of them all got in could, common? Could not bring home the bacon tonight. <laughs> What's the three of them all got in common? They've all played for Toronto and Orlando. Right. Yeah. So it's a throwback to 2019. That's why I went with that. Yeah. So can you name the other two current NBA players that have played for the Magic and the Raptors? Ken Birch. Yeah. Yeah. And oh god. Are they currently on the Magic or the Raptors? No. They're not. No. It's like MCW has not played up there, I don't think. No. Um DJ player. Yes. DJ, yes. yes. Boom. Straight it in did. there. It did. There Good you go. shout with you. There you go. And just a fun fact. Uh, Bismack Biombo and Terence Roth come, come off the bench in the London game in 2016, which three out of the four of us were there. The other one was supposed to be there. <laughs> now, the other one of us wasn't supposed to be there. <laughs> well, you weren't, the but other, you could the have been there. Us, 
yeah, the other one of us had gone down to meet friends and whatever, but I was never going to that game because the tickets went on sale whilst we were in Orlando. So right. it would have meant getting up at two in the morning after after we'd been to a game or something like that to actually have a chance. No, it would be four in the morning when the tickets went on sale when well, you're on holiday. So we, I was never actually going to that game. All right. But you could have gone, but you were on the train. Yeah, on the yeah, way yeah, home. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. <laughs> You know what though? It's yeah. weird, isn't it? I I just thought that that whole experience was so bizarre. Like watching NBA basketball in England with a domestic crowd that was it. Oh, I just I just didn't like it. It was just I didn't I didn't enjoy it at all. It just felt like it wasn't an Orlando crowd. Um, there were just too many kind of fans from all over, sort of thing. And it, it, we're just not as a as a country or as a the way we consume our sport is not the same with all the timeouts and stuff, and yeah. we, it just it just felt it just felt really artificial. And even though it was the home, it was we were at home, weren't we? It was just weird. I think yeah. a lot of them. Are it was, I, I think the London games are a weird atmosphere. Mm. Yeah. Um, you've not got, as you said, you've not got a specific home crowd because basketball fans go to see it because it's the one game potentially that you've got a chance to see in. Um, you've got people from all over Europe come to it. Anyway, and then they just, you've not got fans, they pack it full of people on free tickets and corporate junkets who just aren't interested. Weird atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. too many celebrities. And also the, the fact that they have to explain the rules yeah. in timeouts. And it's like, hang on a second, guys, come on. And then I think that game went to overtime. And yeah, um, there's a few, been a few comments that said, oh, you know, people were packing up and saying, all right, it's a draw. Well, we don't do draws in the NBA. So. It sounds like the end yeah. of the pod squad this week. Have you listened to it? And no. Dante always likes to finish off with what grates him. <laughs> We're just complaining <laughs> about the London games this week. I can see why they've shifted him. Yeah. Yeah. It helps when you drink a lot. I think the last game we went to, G, was at the Knicks and Wizards. And it was basically just two rubbish teams, and we just sat there and got drunk. That was a bomb game. burner on that. Yeah. Oh, mate. <laughs> that was bad. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. We had a Knicks fan with us, so we were just ribbing in the whole time. Shout out to I've, Mark I've only done one on the game. Shout out to Mark. You've only done one. I've only done the, yeah, the uh, New York Milwaukee game, um, which wasn't that brilliant, to be honest with you. Tell you what, speaking speaking in New York, my my magic highlight, my magic fandom highlight, I uh, I saw Orlando at MSG pick up a W at MSG, um, and we were like in the midst of all the New York fans as you were, and it was when it was when New York were rubbish, you know, every year for the last twenty Which years. Which is what I'm saying. It's not narrowed down a lot, has it? Yeah, I've been in the last twenty years, um, but they were just giving. I think it was JJ's rookie year. And they were just giving him dogs abuse. They were just absolutely hurling this dude. And I think he like hit a three in front of the bench with about a minute to go and just did did JJ stuff, you know, like lifted his thing. And I was like, I was there like, whoa, brilliant. <laughs> Love that. Getting to see Orlando win at MSG was absolutely amazing. Beautiful. Yeah. Good stuff. I think that wraps us up this week. Ian, it's been a pleasure, mate. Thank you for coming on. Yeah. Thanks for having me, boys. And I'd I'd just like to I'd just like to say that in terms of flying the flag for Orlando Magic, you guys um, need to step it up because it's really rubbish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> pull your finger out, really. So just just work harder, guys. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, you know, just, just put a little bit in and get a little bit out. That's all I'm asking, all right? We're, we're just tanking, oh, mate, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> no, in all seriousness, though, like, the stuff that you guys do and, and, and what you've done is absolutely brilliant. And for, for all of us, it's like following Orlando as an unsuccessful team from across the pond is not easy. And when you find out that there are other people that suffer as well, it's amazing. <laughs> so, uh, so keep up the good work, boys. And thank you very much for having me on. Nice. Uh, thank you very good much, pleasure, mate. mate. Thank um, you, mate. And uh, just to wrap up, uh, make sure you're following Orlando Magic UK on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. It's all at Orlando Magic UK. Um, check out the website, orlandomagicuk.com, with all our affiliate links. Paul's posted the game day post for today. Does it every game day? Um, 
G's got the magic moments on there and everything else. Um, we've got some new content and stuff coming soon, um, likely in the off season, I think now. Um, and then check out next week's episode where we hope to have George Galanti on. So we'll see you next week. Go magic. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the RP Funding Center here in Lakeland, Florida for tonight's G League matchup featuring the Erie Bayhawks. Ooh. Ooh. And your Lakeland Magic! <laughs> Let's meet tonight's starting lineup. Number 68, the elder statesman of the team, Paul Bacon! And number one, the six foot one inch shooting guard, Mikey Clark! And number 19, <laughs> guard from Cardiff, Wales, Garrett Gio! That is brilliant. Amazing. Love it. Love it. Thank you. That's so superb. Much.